I love subscription services. I love getting a box in the mail with things inside of it that I would have chosen. And if it involves my family and travel, count me in. So I partnered with the Global Sleepover. My friend Gita Raj was on a previous episode where I feature her and her incredible story. You'll have to check it out. And she started the Global Sleepover. Together, we are curating a subscription service called Landmarks of Hope, where you will get a box filled with incredible things for your family to travel around the world together without leaving home. Perfect for a pandemic. And what are these Landmarks of Hope? Well, they're pilgrimage sites. So if you're Catholic or Christian, you're gonna really love it. But what if you aren't? That's okay. We have that covered as well. So go to globalsleepover.com slash landmarks of hope and sign up to get more information. These boxes will be ready by Christmas. When I was growing up in Northern Louisiana, Natchitoches, I was often the only white girl in a lot of situations. And I have to be honest, I loved that. My parents were very intentional. They kept me at a school that was predominantly black or it was definitely less white than the other schools in the town. Maybe that would be a more fair statement. When I finally graduated and left elementary school, I went to East Natchitoches, which was the middle school. The schooling system was a little bit different. It was broken up, not by junior high and, and things like that. There was, there was like a ninth grade center. There was a, a middle school that I went to. Then there was a junior high. I don't know. It was complicated. There were like a lot of buildings, <laughs> which is weird because it was a small town. And uh, I'm in fourth grade and I had my first black teacher, Mrs. Dawson. I tell you what, to this day, she was one of my favorite teachers. There was just something about her and the way that she carried her classroom and the way that she interacted with us as her students. She made me believe in myself. We had representatives in our classroom for student council and you had to be elected. And um, so the school I went to, this middle school was fourth, fifth and sixth grade. So here I am in fourth grade. And I remember Mrs. Dawson coming up to me and saying, so Olivia, are you going to try and be a class representative for the student council? And I was like, yes, yes I am. <laughs> Like I was so like I believed all of a sudden, you know, I remember my mother was so adorable. She was very much into you throw a campaign when you go out for student council. I think everybody else just like told everybody like, hey, I'm running for student council or, you know, I don't know. Maybe they handed out like lollipops. I'm not really sure. My mother I tell you what, she was incredible. We made visors, like made our own visors as if we were playing poker or golf, one of those. And it was like with construction paper and it had like, she punched two holes in the back and we tied a string and it said something like on the brim, like vote for Olivia or I don't know. And then, and then we did not just hand out like little tiny suckers. No, 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 no. No, Vicky's daughter, that's my mom, Vicky, she handed out Tootsie Roll Pops, but wait for it. All right. My mom got very creative, which this is so Vicky, and she took Kleenex and would cover each of the Tootsie Roll Pops and tie a string, you know, you know, just like you do for Halloween and it's on Pinterest and you make these things look like a ghost. That was my campaign candy was I had these, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, now that I think about it, I don't really know why we did that, to be honest. But I know that she wrote on the Kleenex, vote for Liv. So probably she was making her own wrapper. We'll go with that. So I handed out visors. I handed out, you know, <laughs> freshly wrapped Tootsie Roll Pops. And I ended up winning. I ended up winning in that class. I found a picture the other day of that classroom. And it is... Uh, 
predominantly black children with my teacher, Mrs. Dawson. And I, for my entire life until I moved to Houston, never noticed, not noticed that, that they weren't black. Right. Or that my teacher wasn't, I didn't notice that it was a big deal. I didn't know otherwise. I, I had no idea that that's not how every classroom in America looked like or that your teachers could be black. And I'm trying to think of when I ever had another African-American teacher, I would say high school, maybe when I was in, in here in Houston, that woman changed my life because she believed in me. She was kind to me. She was an incredible teacher. And I love the experience I had coming from Natchitoches to Houston. My academic experience when I walked into a very white neighborhood, very white school, very white everything, one of the things I first did, believe it or not, was I tried to find um, students of color to hang out with. I felt, I felt really comfortable there because that's what I knew. I knew kids of diversity. I knew kids that were different than me. Not that I didn't like white kids. Are you kidding me? A married white man, had white kids, all, you know, have a ton of white friends. I'm white. I'm not ashamed to be white. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I was lucky to grow up in a time with parents who were forward thinking and who allowed me to have experiences that has broadened my horizons and, and helped me have conversations that I'm able to have. The conversation I'm going to have today is with an incredible educator. He happens to be a black man, a man of color. And here's what's fantastic about him. He was often the only child, adult, professional of color in every situation he was going to. And he didn't know that. Like he didn't realize that that was his lot in life. I really connected with that piece of my guest story. And I also connect a lot with how he had a white woman in his school. Either it was his teacher or his nurse who have to listen who influenced his life. And I think that's really fantastic. I am so proud to introduce you to a former professional football player, okay, who leaves that life and dedicates it to the education of children. And what he's done in the state of Texas is extraordinary as a man of color because he has been the first many, many times, you guys, Oh my goodness, I am so thrilled to introduce you to him. I call him coach, but you can call him Mr. Robert Morrison. Hello, welcome to my incredible guest, Coach Morrison. I know you have a first name, it's Robert, but that is I, feel, <laughs> I feel like I feel like you can only be called coach. It's kind of like a chef, you know, like you've earned this amazing respect. So, Coach Morrison, hello. Welcome. Thank you for coming on and talking to me today. Well, good, good morning to you, Liv. I've heard a lot about you, and it's a blessing having the opportunity to, to meet you. Oh, and, thank and, you. Uh, and to be on your podcast this morning. So, I think it's a, it's a blessing. So, I'm very excited about it. I am so excited. You, I know about you, Coach Morrison, even though I am not a student that you would have taught when, when my husband met you. My husband was a football player at a high school you were teaching at the time. Obviously, this was just like a couple of years ago. Not really. Yes. This was like 25 years ago. <laughs> That's right. But my husband was one of your students, and I met him when I was in high school. And so I have literally heard about you for 25 years. You were his coach. And, um, and that's how I know about you, but I know that you have a bigger story that started before you were at my husband's high school. You have an incredible right. story before you got to Westfield and I don't know all the dates and all the time. So I know we'll get there, but tell me a little bit about yourself, what you went to school for your amazing degrees that you have kind of how you started out your life and then how you got into education. Okay. Well, I went to Lexington High School. That's a town that's kind of about 50 miles east of Austin, small rural community. Had 516 people when I was growing up. And I remember when I left, somebody changed the population sign to On the thing? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's a real <laughs> thing. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yes, it, it really is. Oh, that's yeah. crazy. So, and so I, I, I was going to go to Texas and then I changed my mind and I ended up going to a small a Baptist university, Howard Payne University that's in Brownwood, Texas. And so, you know, I, I was a small country boy going there and, and, and that town was big enough for me because it had about 30,000 people. Well, oh, that people is from big. The, yeah, from the yeah. city. Compared to 500, sure. Yeah. People from the city, they thought it was small. They call it Deadwood because there was nothing to do, but <laughs> it was it was in the Bible Belt, and so it, it was it was right for me. And so I got there, and 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 I excelled there. And being a country boy, I remember the first time when I made the dean's list, I actually thought I was in trouble. I had no <laughs> idea what did I do to get in trouble because I'd never heard the word dean before. Right? Who and has? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't realize it was for academic accomplishment. That's but, awesome. Uh, at Howard Payne, it, it gave me a, it reinforced my, my faith because it's a faith-based institution and, and it's a great school for someone who wants to send their children to be in a Christian environment. And so, but at the time when I went there, I, I really didn't realize all of that. But uh, I've always had the comfort of going somewhere by myself and not knowing anyone and kind of starting starting my story there so that was the case at Howard Payne I didn't know a soul when I went on wow did you play football at Howard Payne yes I was a high school football star and then I went to Howard Payne to play college football and I when I went there I was a small kid I was about 5'10 and weighed about 200 at the most and and now I'm six five and weigh three hundred, but I six hit my five. growth spurt when I was at Howard Payne. Wow! Over Christmas holiday, I went home and and then when I came back, I came had back a man. on about four <laughs> inches and about fifty pounds. Because some of the coaches w walked by me and say, I heard one of them say, "That's a good looking kid. Who is that?" And they then I'd turn around and I was like, "It's me, <laughs> Morrison." And they say, golly, how'd you grow so much? But it was just getting home Some to my grandmother's country cooking. Yes, <laughs> it was <laughs> getting home and cooking. So at Howard Payne, I, I excelled. I became very popular there, more popular than I had realized over time. And so I started accumulating awards then. And, and, and so I, I've, I've been so blessed with achievements that I have conquered. And, it, and it's happened, those achievements didn't come from a desire to collect achievements. It was me meeting monuments. I remember the president of the university on the day of graduation, shaking my hand and telling me what a credit I was uh, to the African-American community and uh, that um, I had achieved things that no one wanted no other one it had i didn't i didn't realize that that's incredible and and i and i and howard Payne was a it was a small conservative christian university but i realized that we went through racial problems <clears throat> when i was at howard Payne, and it, and it wasn't intentional racism from the standpoint you know where you would call the n-word but i would talk to students because the only people of color at Howard Payne were people who were in athletics. Oh, really? Yes. So there wasn't a handful of other uh, black kids who just went to Howard Payne. So I realized that uh, a lot of people just had an ignorance of black people. Because I remember people talking to me and it's like, you're the first black person I've seen in real life. I've seen them on television before. Wow. And I was like, really? So they came from such different uh home style and 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 areas that they just had never ever seen huh. people of color so wow. then i would hear about the the biases that they had or their thoughts of what they had about like people and so on and so i I've, I've always had a skill to kind of break down walls because even though i'm big and intimidating a lot of people they found me to be approaching so People got to learn my story, and so they got to learn who I was. And in a short period of time, I realized uh, a lot of people they were 
they still had their misconceptions and fears toward other people of color. But for me, they had a different story and that different story was created because uh, the comfort they had in talking to me. Because I, I, I knew really early on, once people have an opportunity to sit down and talk to you and interact with you, a lot of those preconceived uh, stereotypes and ideas go out the window because they realize you're a real person and and therefore that you're totally seen in a different light. I love that. So, Coach, what degree did you get at Howard Payne? What were you working on? I got a, a Bachelor of Science at, at Howard Payne University uh, with a match, uh, minor in history because I've always been a historian based on my grandparents growing up. So I've always loved history and, and and it was something I realized I really wanted to excel at. And, and I, at that time I had started receiving attention from pro football. So I was always dealing with scouts mm. coming on campus and agents coming on campus. And, and I learned a lot about them also because I remember agents coming on campus and them saying stuff, well, when you, you come with us so we can, I can get you some weed. And I was like, I don't smoke weed. Oh, and, interesting. And then I was like, okay. So I knew right then I, I cut the cord with them that mm -hmm. they were out the window. When I, and my childhood dream was the Cowboys, but, uh, I, but I was taken by the Seahawks and it was a dream because I never realized that I, I never had the mindset that I was going to play pro football. I That's grew up and became, yeah, I grew up and became very good at it. And then all at once I realized, you know, that was an opportunity that was there that I never had. I wasn't one of those guys that sat around and said, I'm going pro. Well, as a little kid, everybody thinks they go, go pro when they're playing in sure. the backyard. Right. But I, I never thought that. And then all at once I realized it was there in front of me. So. That's when I signed with the Seahawks and that was short lived, but I, because I, I, I blew my knee out. Mm. And so, uh, the, the doctor told me he could repair it and I could play for years or he saw you could have a limp after a few years if he got hurt again. And I, I simply asked him if it was your son, what would you tell him? And he told me, uh, if it was my son, he said, I would tell him to, you've got your degree and you got your education to move on to something forward. And I, and I took him at that statement. And so I, then I go back to Brownwood and the second day I'm back at Brownwood, this guy calls me and I don't know who he is. And he asked me to go meet him for lunch. And so I went and met him for lunch and it was this big German guy named John Meeks. He's a superintendent at, at Bangs Independent School District, where what my first job was. And he sat down and told me at lunch, he said, I have watched you for uh, four years in college. I know what you're made of and the kind of person you are. He said, I want to hire you in my school district in, in Bangs, which is in Brown County. And so, and I said, I was just listening to him. And he told me he was the first coach in the state of Texas to recruit an African-American kid and it was at um, Cisco Junior College. And what he told me, he said, I, I want to integrate my district. And he said, you go deal with a lot of crap. He said, you go deal with racism. And he said, but I know, he said, if you come with me, I got your back. He said, and I'll take care of you. He said, and if you do well, I'll be able to hire other people of color. Wow. And he said, uh, if you don't, then they'll be able to say, I told you so. <laughs> so and no then, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> what year? Yeah. What, what what year was this? What year was the Seattle that was, Seahawks? That was in 1982. That was 1982. Was that all the same year? The Seahawks and being yes. hired by the school district. So 1982, yeah. you're playing pro football, and then you find yourself with the pressure of right. being this incredible African American man for the uh -huh. school district. So yes. that which how amazing for this man to have a vision, yes. larger than 1982. I, I know it. I, when I think back about it and I was like that he was such a visionary and yeah. he was so about diversity at a time when no one else, because I remember when it hit the papers and stuff in Brownwood where I was hired, you know, that people would comment on there and they would say no other 
no other school has a nigger coach. Water they have to have one, and and people in the in the community there in the town where I work. I remember with the older people, a lot of them never knew my name. They just called me oh, that that N word coach. Oh my God! But then I but the kids, I realized that. Uh, that, that they didn't feel that way. They got to know who I was. You know, I had a license plate that said be cool once. So they created this <laughs> persona in their head that this guy is cool to everybody else. And, <laughs> but I, I really can say with the kids, with the exception of a few kids, I never, ever heard a racial concern. And then I realized that the kids were going to be the change because I could tell they didn't find race as an issue with me. They just knew me as a person they liked and was funny and would pick on them and take jabs back and forth. And uh, we moved on from there and it ended up being a, a very successful career. And then I thought back uh, when I started high school, I was like, I was one of the first kids of color to go to my, my school when it integrated when wow. I was in the first grade. Yeah. And, and so part of my legacy in life has that been that I realized wherever I have been, I have been the first person of color. When I went to Westville, it was the, what's the job I took after Banks, it was the same way I was first black. That's my husband's school is Westfield. So you were the first black coach in Banks. Yes. Is that B-A-N-G-S? Uh -huh. Is that how? B-A-N-G-S. Okay. And then the first right. black coach at Westfield High School, which is in Houston. Yes. Which is a predominantly black school, or that's kind of the- Predominantly black now, but at yeah. the time when we went there, it was just a handful. Really? A, a handful. And y'all are of awesome at football. Y'all killed us. My high school client, y'all just would sweep us. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know I, if they I play anymore, that. but back in the day, we hated playing you guys. Yeah. <laughs> y'all would uh, annihilate yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I was the first there, and but everywhere I've gone, so I went to, um, from there, I went to Spring High as the first black administrator at Spring High. Okay. Really? You were the first black administrator at Spring High School? Yes. That is crazy. What year was that? That was when, that would have been 1997. Okay. So you were, how from, long were you at Westfield? I was at Westfield for eight years. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you went from yeah. Westfield to Spring, which anybody uh -huh. in the Houston area knows that those two our close high schools, they're in the same little district, uh -huh. so. And they were so different at the, the yeah. time. Because Westfield was the district that everyone wanted to come to. Right. It was a new kid on the block, and it was considered kind of wealthy for the most part. That's and fascinating. Upper in income. So you, and, and, and in those two schools, you had only a handful of kids of color. So you, it's, it's weird now how it changed in that that change came about when Metro busing came out and Hurricane Katrina relocated a lot of people in the area. It really changed the dynamics of those schools and the schools never really caught up after that time because you had an influx of sometime 500 kids that came from New Orleans and so on it, with the, you know, it, it brought in gang problems and impoverished problem and they were displaced and so so the they never adjusted impact. that yes oh, def definitely had. yeah absolutely so you were at spring as the first administrator so do uh -huh. you have master's degrees yeah and i've skipped that a little bit i got when i got my master's from howard Payne, it when started teaching it was i think five years later just about five years later i actually started on my master's by accident <laughs> Uh, everything's by accident with you i uh, ended up as a pro football player by accident yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I, I i received this letter in the mail and it was from the university of texas and it talked about offering <laughs> uh offering uh six hours of free education for someone you had to apply for it it was a grant and it, those six hours could work for your masters well i start filling it out and basically fill it out and then decided I don't want to do this this takes place over the summer I <laughs> ha haven't had my summer off so I threw it in the trash well that afternoon uh the next day I saw one of my principal and he came to me he said 
Martha, and he said, you see the mail I put on your desk? And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, and he said, I threw, he said, I dropped one of the envelopes in the trash. And he said, I noticed in the trash, there was an envelope that was sealed in there that you had filled out. And he said, I'm lucky I found it and I picked it up and I sent it in. And I said, well, I, I said, that was something I had changed my mind on. I said, I meant, I said, I meant to tear it in half. He said, well, I sent it in. <laughs> Oh, well, gosh. it was probably probably about a month later. I got contact from U University of Texas. Says you you won the six hours that you can work on your your masters. And I was like, mm. I didn't intend to do this, but I decided to do it. So I went there that summer, and it was so interesting because I I, I enjoyed going there. And then on the last day of the class, the professor came up to me and he said. Are you go? Are you planning on working on your master's? And I was like, No. I said I just took these six hours because I enjoy history and it, some of it was economics and so on. And he said, Well, you ought to consider working on your master's. And he said, He said we give the GRE tomorrow morning. This is on a be a Saturday morning. He told me on Friday afternoon. He said we give the GRE tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. He said you can show up there and. and have a $75 check and on by standby, he said, you could, you could possibly get in to take the GRE. And I'm sitting there like, what is the GRE? Oh my gosh. No Are you idea kidding me? What the <laughs> GRE was. And so, so I, I hesitated on it, but I got my $75 check and I said, I went there the next morning and I'm always one of these to want to be the earliest there. So I'm there early and I remember just sitting there for, hours and then people would trickle in and out and and i remember they said the test started at eight o'clock well i was the only one still sitting there at around seven fifty-five, and uh, someone stepped out and said we got one spot one person bailed out and so i went in to take the gre and i remembered taking the gre didn't know have any idea what it was about but when i sat down to take the gre after I got through writing my name and address on it, uh -huh. I was never sure of another thing I wrote on that test because <laughs> it blew my mind. But the people professor, study forever for the GRE. They buy books, I know they it. get tutors, and you walk in. I cannot. Yes, I, I, I walk in, not even Stop. know what the acronym stands for. And then a, a pro, then a professor hit. But I remember the professor told me. Cause he kind of knew that I wasn't going to do well on it. He said, <laughs> he said, if you don't do well on it, he said, you've made uh, two A's. And he said, if you have, he said, if you have at least a B average and you fail the GRE, you can still continue. You just got to make sure you make two A, I mean, two B's in the new, new semester. So when, when I walked out of that, that GRE, I felt like I was probably the dumbest person <laughs> in the world. <laughs> because I had no idea and I'm sitting there like I'm basically just checking answers sometimes because I have no idea what I'm doing you're making patterns <laughs> like you're yes. doing flowers uh-huh and so <laughs> so he, he he called me and told me I, when I got the re results from the GRE I had no <laughs> I knew exactly what that result was going to be that I didn't pass it but so I decided to go back and take those uh, next hours and then I made two A's again. And so then it became uh, obsolete that of the GRE and I went on and finished my, uh, finished my master's up. And actually when I came to Westfield, the last class that I had, I would have to drive back to Stephenville twice a, twice a week during coaching wow. season and stuff to finish to up my GRE. So that's how I got my G, that's how I got my GRG. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> When it became working for my administrative certification, uh, it was five years after that. And then well, we were just talking about a uh, guy and I said, we ought to get our mid-management mid certification become principal. And I remember the guy that well, I was talking to, both of us said, well, yeah, we can get it, but we have no intention to ever become principal. Because we had seen some principals that kind of just walked around, drink coffee, and I saw a lot of those. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they and love you can still their walkie-talkie. 
They love that walkie-talkie. They love the walkie-talkie, and they would just be chatting on it, and and I was power like, trip. <laughs> like, I don't. I, I was like, I'm not gonna be a principal. I said, I, I like dealing with kids and so on. But so he and I talked to each, each other into going and getting our um, uh, mid mid management certification from Prairie View. We went on Wednesday nights and Saturday mornings, and so we finished that up. So. Uh, and that's how I got to spring when you were big. Yeah. So, okay, here's my question. I still don't get the principal system in high school because there's like 700 of you. And there's like, there's like assistant principals. And then there's like, they have a, I don't know. Like seriously, yeah. at Klein, we had like 50. And I never knew who like the real principal was. So explain right. to me. And a lot of a lot of people don't know who the real principal no, is. No, it's confusing because yeah. you have one that you're assigned to here in Houston. This is kind of how it worked, where you know right. A through you know G part goes of the to alphabet. This guy. Uh -huh. Yeah, totally. And so, uh -huh. wh who were you? Is that's what I'm asking. <laughs> I'm asking. Yeah. Well, when I when I started out over there, I was uh, I started out as assistant principal. I was my alphabet was F through K. Oh, I wouldn't have found you. Uh -huh. and, you and I remember anyway. and I remember when I was assigned that alphabet uh, the, the principal uh, was Gloria Marshall at the time and she handed me a list of names on it that were problem kids and family and, and I remember the list a couple of letters that were attached to it that said were letters from the uh, lawyer to the parents that any more verbal abuse Toward your administrator, the district will take action and so oh on. My God. So when I realized when I accepted that part of the alphabet, I accepted the alphabet of crazy. And so when I <laughs> and I and I thought my when I thought of my alphabet was F through K, and I was like, if I had a chance to fill in two other letters, I know the two letters that would go between F and K because <laughs> they, were crazy and everybody knew that that was the craziest part of the alphabet, oh, the alphabet those f through yeah. k's yeah the f through k's and i was like yeah i know what two letters that would fit in between that, that. is hilarious <laughs> so do you think you were getting hazed because <laughs> you were the new guy they're like we'll get well, the, f the new k's i knew the guy. new guy would get all all the stuff that was there and uh well you are six but, five so they probably thought uh -huh. all right this guy yeah. can handle it yeah so were and, you and coaching so no, I wasn't coaching and I had to go straight administration. And that was really a challenge for me because I had coached at Westfield. And and part of the reason I didn't want to go into administration because I so enjoyed being with the kids. And for the most part in football, you were dealing with positive kids. You know, you had some people that would kind of stray off but you could bring them back online. And so I had a fear of going into administration because I didn't want to do that. When they were trying to hire me at spring, I said no to them. I bet I said no 10 times and they were calling and calling. And so, and one of the things that people will follow as I went through my career, very seldom did I ever have to advertise for a job. They sought me out. And that That's was what happened at spring. Wow. And that, and it, so they were calling me and I said, I wasn't interested and they had the best friend call me and I said, I wasn't interested. They had the athletic director, Coach Leonard George, call me and I said, I wasn't interested. And so I finally, they finally talked me into interviewing and I interviewed. And, and when I left there, I was like, I don't want to do that. But then I get a call that they want to come in for a second interview. And, and it was literally on a Sunday night before I started on the first day on a Monday that I finally accepted it the job over there at spring oh my because gosh. we had we had uh we were playing football there and coach Millard had just retired and there's a new guy coming in named David Bill and I really look forward to working with David because he was he was a Christian man and I just loved his energy and so I was really looking forward to making another state championship run if we had an opportunity to do so but that's how that's how I ended up at spring and then I would hear well you know first person of color here. But uh, when I went to Montgomery, the same way, I had no intention of leaving Montgomery. I would have stayed in spring, but then I was recruited up there. So what do Montgomery. you do? What, what did you do at Montgomery? Are you at Montgomery now? 
No, I, I've retired. In okay, you retired. So, but is that where you ended? Was in Montgomery? No, I, I ended in Abilene, Texas. Oh, good gracious. Okay, wait. So, I, Montgomery, what did you do in Montgomery? <laughs> I, uh, Montgomery, I was an assistant principal and I grew to the associate principal. Same thing as I did. At, you were the first person and, of color. Yeah, first do person that. of color there. Okay. And, and, and I was a, end up being associate principal. And the associate principals at a major high school, you don't have kids that are assigned to you. You're really the person in the associate who deals with all the dirty stuff. Because mm. the principal, a lot of times at some of the university, I mean, our high schools, they become kind of the figurehead of the school. And right. they're shaking hands and they're like the vice people, president, I feel like, like of the yeah. country, you know, like how that yeah. guy's just supposed to like, we yeah. don't really know what the vice president does. <laughs> That's right. And so, but, uh, right. so I had that role of being the person who had to deal with kids when we were expelling kids or. It's like bad uh, cop. You're the bad cop, good cop. Yeah. You had to do all the bad stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's but, I, tough. but I noticed in that time in dealing with, uh, people in that, cause that's the hardest position probably to, to have on any administrative team. I, I didn't judge people. I listened to them. And then I, even to this day, those people that I dealt with in some of the most critical moments, uh, are still close to me because a lot of those people are on my social, social media page. And I'm sitting there like, golly, when I'm dealing with your parent, I wanted <laughs> to throat punch you. And now you're reaching out that you've befriend, you've befriended me. <laughs> uh, Cause I could deal with some crazy, crazy stuff. And, and, and I tell people all the time, if I ever wrote a book about experiences and stuff I went through, it, it is just out of this world because I would realize these people, they would get to know me and they would tell me their most personal dark secrets that I'm sitting there like, there's no way. I remember parents and stuff telling me something. And then I would look up in a corner and I was like, I gotta be, I'm being pranked. There's gotta be a camera in here somewhere to see my reaction when I hear these conversations. I realized over time there was something about me that they would, all the parents would tell stuff. They, they would, would trust. Yeah, they, they were the trust. And one reason was that they knew it didn't, they knew it wouldn't go outside of them. And mm -hmm. then and they knew that I wouldn't judge them, which re really created a great platform for kids, me dealing with kids and students after that, because I would hear many times I would meet some parent that might come up there because their kid was caught with drugs and they would talk to me and then I, they would say, well, one of my best friends is had a kid here several years ago and they told me that you were an honorable, trustworthy man, whatever you said, that was the truth and I could trust that. And so they wouldn't fight the consequence and where most parents would have fought those consequences and tried to lure you up and so on. So there's a, there was a trust thing that was related to every one of my campus. Uh -huh. And that's, and then that's yeah. always been a, that's always been a great, uh, that's always been something that's important to me was to, to be honest with people and to trust them because you, I found out early on in education, one of the things that surprised me where it was I was a teacher or administrator, I assume that all teachers and administrators came to school and did just like I did, that they worked hard, they were on time, they treated their kids with respect. <laughs> and then I'd start noticing their teachers that are late all the time, their teachers that lie on kids. Yeah. And their right. te teachers that gossip around. And so as they're an administrator, I, yeah. yeah, they're, they're real people. people. And I, I, and I noticed that, so uh, that that kind of surprised me that they didn't operate from the same mindset that I did. And, but it was something that was important to me, and I, that's always been important to me. So uh, if you, if someone asks me something and they don't want to hear the truth about it, then they probably shouldn't ask me. And I'm not <laughs> going to be in an attacking mode, but uh, in my way, I'm going to communicate how I really feel about it. And, and I know that's been very helpful. I think that's great. So yeah. you've had so many students. I'm sure you don't even know the number of lives you've touched. I can't imagine if you <laughs> like if you have a right. number, but it's got to be in the thousands, I would assume. Yeah, well, I was looking at the from the students 
and parents I've touched and teachers. I was I did a rough estimate one day, and I was like, it's got to be around fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. Yeah, because of, you know I was in education for thirty six years, and Gosh. just looking at the schools and stuff I've been exposed to, wow. I would say it's it's easily been easily been that's that incredible so there's yeah. got to be a couple that stand out in a positive mm -hmm. way either right. you know like in the uh in the i'm trying to think of those movies that have to do with the teachers and the students and the teacher helps mm -hmm. the student they do great like dangerous minds that's michelle pfeiffer though that's a terrible movie but um who are those kids who is like a story that you would have thought at the beginning well, this kid's going nowhere, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and now they're, I don't know, you know, president, CEO of some amazing company mm -hmm. and a philanthropist. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any stories like that? Out of the I, I have family? stories like that. And some of them are, aren't stories of how their full life ended, but I know that I changed the window of what their life was at the time. I remember being in, at Westfield and I, I had a class. Every teacher has a class that drives them crazy. Yes. And I had one of those classes that was the first class after lunch. And I knew I had to be there on time after lunch because they were a class. It was, it was made up of all these kids who were from different backgrounds. There were kids who had been in jail. There, I had a kid in there that was a white supremacist. I had a kid that was in there that said she and her friend, they thought about me over the weekend because they drank blood and they, they thought about my blood dripping down into the cup when they were drinking it. And I was what? Like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Good gracious. Yeah. Parents are but, freaking out right now. They're like, I don't uh, want my <laughs> Yeah. And, and I know some of it was shock value, but some of it was real. Then, oh and then gosh. I, what I realized that class about, there were no two people in there that liked each other. Really? And, and I had a kid in there that was a, a white supremacist. And I remember him wearing his Doc Martin boots and leaving a print that had the swap sticker on the floor and so on. And, and he would sit in his desk on his haunches. And when I would walk by him, a lot of times he would spit on the floor, you know, just as his dis, wow. uh, dismay for me. And I remember him being one of the first accomplishments because he came to me one day and he's like, he said, I have tried to hate you all year long. And he said, because my family was reared that way. He, said, he told me he was part of the Klan. And his family had been reared to hate black people. And because of who I was, the way I carried myself every day, he had changed his view on black people. Wow. So that was one of the first ones I realized how I, I touched. I have and, goosebumps. Uh, That's incredible. Yeah, have you kept yeah. in touch with him since school? Have you heard from him? I, I haven't been able to keep in touch with him, but the last I heard from him, he was doing very well. Good. And, yeah, he had gotten in, involved with the church. And, wow. That's uh, and beautiful. And then I, I, was, I would see kids that I never, I never talked about my faith at school, but there was something about it that they would realize my faith and because I remember a young lady coming up to me and asking me about what somebody else's faith. And I said, I really don't know about their faith. And then she made a statement about my faith. And I said, I said, I've never talked to you about my faith before. And she said, but everybody knows about your faith. And I remember I told her, I said, that's the greatest compliment that anyone's ever given me. I said, because I believe your faith should be defined by the way you walk your walk rather than how you tell people but she would tell me how I, I can't tell you the number of kids that come up to me and told me that they had started going to church and they had started believing but because of me uh, young uh, young ladies that were sexually assaulted how they would come up and tell me and so on and I remember talking to parents months later and they came up with this breaking news and they were telling me our daughter was sexually assaulted. And I said, yeah, I know. It was about a neighbor. And then they realized I knew the story. So one thing I realized, you know, because the way I was in touch with kids, I provided some kind of therapy to them. Because most kids want to talk to an adult that they can trust. Right. And if they don't find one they can trust, a lot of times they end up 
in the hands of ones they can't trust that are go take their abuse to another level. But um, so I, I've seen kids that were homeless, never, and I would ask them, well, what are you planning on doing? Well, I'll probably end up in jail because my mom and dad are in jail. And when I would talk to them and then they graduate from high school. I remember a young man in particular, he, he was a big a knucklehead as I'd ever seen. And I remember talking to him every day because I wouldn't get on his level. And he would make racial comments and he would tell me his staff to go bring the clan up there because he was a clan kid. And I remember putting him in an alternative school and every day I'd go in there and check on him. And I remember telling him the day that he had graduated and he was an 18 year old kid and he literally broke down and cried because he was telling me that I was the reason he graduated. And he said, I never, ever, he said, I'm the first graduate in my family. I never, ever saw graduation in my picture. And it was just something to see a kid that was so overwhelmed with pride that he had accomplished some goal that he never thought he would accomplish. And, but I remember teachers going through stuff when they were, you know, I, we always kind of thought teachers had pretty good lives. Then I realized there's teachers in abusive relationships. The teachers that need shelters. So I remember uh, helping teachers to find shelters and or I'd contact some friend of mine that was married and I'd have them uh, set it up where they could go stay with them for a while or in times when they were uh, felt most threatened. I paid for parents rent before. Wow. And loaned the money for cars. So that's I, incredible. So I, 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 I've, I've seen done a lot, a lot of things seen uh, and I've things. seen a lot Yeah. And, and, and the reward comes a lot of times that years later, they will contact me and what uh, a student did it the other day. He told me, he said, when he, he grew up with his grandmother and he said his grandmother told him to always give people their roses while they can still smell them. Because what he was talking about, we go I to funerals that. and you have these great people and then you hear all these positive stories told about them after they're dead, right. which they can't smell their roses then. And so he chimed in and did that. And then all at once there was this influx of kids who were doing the same thing. Well, that's something that's always happened to me. I, I tell people all the time that the things people, I hope they're, they're saying about me when the time that I die, when I pass to be with the Lord kids have actually told me so kids come back and tell me those stories of how it changed their life and even kids that i haven't uh, uh stayed in touch with one of the most touching situations was one day uh, i had a, this coach he had gone to a funeral in tennessee and he came back and he was he said he said coach can i have a minute of your time and this guy always scared me because when he said he had a minute of needed a minute every time you knew it was about 30 minutes because he never had a story that was less than 30 minutes and I was trying <laughs> to go somewhere and so can I have a minute of time and I was like well yeah so he started he said I went to this wedding and he said at the we wedding rehearsal he said this young lady told this story about how she was suicidal she was abused by her her father and she said she thought of dying every day she actually had planned it and tried it before and she said uh, she made it through it and she went on to smu and she met her the love of her life there and then they got engaged and got married but she told a story about who was responsible for that and now i'm sitting there thinking it's an interesting story and he said and when he he said he went up to this young lady and asked her said um that was what told her that was a beautiful story and said where did you go to school and she said i went to school in in texas and she said he said that story that you're talking about from someone in texas said yeah he said this guy he spoke to me every single morning even when i didn't want him to he said he would speak to me he said because that time i didn't i didn't want to talk to anyone and i wanted to block out everyone and said and then she said, but he kept speaking to me, even though if I didn't like it. And then he told me, then I smiled one day and he said, I can see into your heart now through your smile. And I said, uh, she told him what I said. And she said, 
Then the next thing you know, he got to a point where he hugged me and I would hug him. And she said, there was a day when I, I had planned I was going to kill myself that afternoon. And a guy hugged me and he said, you have great things in the future for you. I said, and I, and I, he was telling me the story and I said, I said, well, that's, I said, that's cool. That's very touching. And he, and he said, I asked that young lady where she went to school at, and she told me Texas. Then I asked her where in Texas. And she said, Montgomery High School. And he said, well, who was that guy? She said, it was this big black guy. I really didn't know his name when I first started, but his name is uh, Mr. Morrison. And when he told me that story, and she said, that person is responsible for the reason of me being alive today, that reason that I met my husband and the reason that I have children and, and the whole thing. And I'm talking about, it almost brought me to tears in the hallway when I, I get teared up when I think about that story. But I, I, re, I, re, I remember young ladies doing that, but I, she's probably one of a lot of kids that would do that because if I saw a kid that was kind of down, I reached out to that kid. I sat by that kid in the cafeteria. I, and so that young lady, she grew on to be successful and have a great family, but she attributed to, to me picking at her and wouldn't accept no for an answer. And whenever she told me, I don't want to talk to you, and I'm just like, okay, well, see you tomorrow. And then I'm way better again tomorrow. <laughs> Did you remember and, but, who she was specifically when he told you? I didn't at the time, and that's but when kind it of showed me, though. Uh -huh. because that just shows what you did and you made me cry you're right. my first guest that's made me cry actually and i've heard some pretty great stories doing this but that yeah. is so beyond touching and moving because you shared with me earlier when you were in fourth fifth grade about someone mm -hmm. who impacted your life yes. i think that would be a great story to share right now because it really kind of segues into i would say your legacy of of who you became as an administrator and as an right. educator so what happened to you in fourth and fifth grade that, that changed the way that, that you saw yourself? Okay. Well, I, I was, uh, I didn't, I didn't realize that we were poor, but most people in our community were poor. I love that you didn't realize anything about your life. I think that is, yeah. that might be the hidden gem of this entire it, conversation. It really, it, it really it is. It is. It's great. It, 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 it is. To, uh, it's it's a, a plus and a negative sometimes. Yeah. Because that's a hidden gem. And uh, like is. in college, I'll talk to these friends of mine who went to college and they'll tell me I really had a crush on you in college and I was like I wasn't aware of it I, and they're sitting there like and I'm thinking I used to like you too and I never was aware of any of those things it. but uh, it's 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 almost been a, it's like a surprise you know some of my hidden gems and and I people who know where I eat I don't ever order when I go to eat ever do a drive through anything i just say surprise me and you wait do not through, uh, yes i did they'll say every fast food restaurant anytime you sit down at a restaurant any down i eat your whole I life say, yeah, you just say yeah. surprise me i say surprise me because my grandparents grew up we ate what was on the table you didn't <laughs> my grandmother didn't ask you what you want to eat you ate what was on the table or you didn't eat and when we, we visited someone it was usually an older person. You ate what was on the table. So I never had gotten into choosing what I wanted to eat. Really? And so when I, and when I went off, I, I did that same thing. So now it's it's just something I do. I say, surprise me. And they'll look at me like, are you serious? And I was like, yes. It seems like a lot of pressure. <laughs> uh-huh. Are, are, uh, anything you don't like? And I'll say hunger. And that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> but I've had... The, I've had chefs that prepare a meal for me and come out and they'll ask me that story, what what led to this. Wow. They'll prepare they'll prepare a meal that's not on the menu for me. They a lot of times will comp the meal. I have probably three thousand dollars worth of gift cards. Because oh I ate at their restaurant, they'll send those to me. So but uh, I guess in life I had kind of gone on that surprise me thing. But getting back to the the fourth grade i remember we had to go in there to get uh, a shot you know there was a mandatory mandatory shot and this the school nurse in there they had a nurse in there that prior to then that was she just had a negative reputation because she didn't care about kids and 
<laughs> she just basically stabbed you in the arm. <laughs> and everybody you talked to was afraid of her. <laughs> but this one nurse came in and, and she, I remember her hugging me one day was the first thing. And then I remember one time she got me some clothes because she realized that I was, I was poor. And then I had a nickname that I went by and then I'll give it to you. The nickname was Buster. And I remember her hugging me one day and saying, you need to go by your full name, Robert, you're going to be something great in life and do good things. And you don't need to have the, your childhood nickname Buster. And I remember, I remember that impact to me. I can remember it like it was yesterday, her saying, you need to go by your name. Mm. It's Robert because it's this thing. So empowering about uh -huh. your name. We think our names aren't a big deal, but they're a really yeah. big deal. Yeah. And then I remember she hugged me and I knew for the first time that was the first white lady that ever hugged me. And I, and so as I went through school, I, you know, I, I received honors there and on the who's who's list and made the honor society. And I would hear it up those things where well, you're the first person of color to make the honor society. You're the first person of color to do this. And my, and I was really close with my peers, even though I had, had fought most of them when they were kids, because <laughs> me being one of the first kids on color, I remember when we went to school, they would use the N word, the kids would, cause they brought them home. The teachers were from the community. So they would use the N word or you could oh tell the gosh. racial biases from them also. Wow. But this lady was the first person that I realized she just saw me as a person. And, and, and so I realized that I was going to be that kind of person in my life that someone could count on, that would reach out and that everyone had value. Cause I have a quote that I read to the guys last night. Uh, and the quote was, I want to be the kind of adult that I needed as a kid when I was growing up. And mm -hmm. so that, that's a quote that I use. Because a, a lot of kids need uh, that special adult to get them to the to the next side growing up, and she was she was for me. And then my high school coach, he was probably, he was the first. My high school coach was the first male that I remember. He was a white guy, and he was the first male that I remember hugging me. Uh, my, I think my uncle might have some when he was younger, but. He, he wasn't around me much, but my grandfather wasn't a hugger. My grandmother was, and all her sisters and aunts were, but males didn't hug other males. And that was a big deal yeah. as a young man growing up to have another man yeah. show affection, right? Yeah, th that Positive show affection. affection. And, right. And, and he would talk to me, and I realized he wasn't talking at me. He talked to me. Mm -hmm. And so and I remember one day he had a meeting that was planned, but he had started talking to me and he was late to his meeting because he wanted to hear what I had to say. And so, and then I can remember how that translated into me, me as a professional. When I mentored kids, I would always call them in every week, at least 15 minutes. And I would tell them, I said, in these 15 minutes, nothing else in my world matters except you and what you have to say and what's on your mind. And I would see kids that wouldn't talk to anybody. Well, they would get in there and they were chatty as heck. I remember a kid that probably said one word a week and I would call him in and I would say hello and he would say hello. And then that was basically all he said to the, the rest of the meeting. Then I would say, okay, next week, we're gonna get to the point where you can say at least two words and then, <laughs> And then, then I remember the day he came in and sat down and he said, how are you doing, Mr. Morrison? And I remember like, okay, we made it. We broke through. You did and it. And then he started interacting from that point on. And so, uh, but I've, I've had some, some great people in my life and, uh, and I just want to carry that torch. But from those other jobs I've had, when I left Montgomery and went to Sweeney, it was on the news that was the first black principal in the history of Brazoria County. When I went, I was recruited at Abilene. As soon as I re uh, signed there, I, the news that I was the first African American principal in the history of Taylor County. So part of my legacy has been that I've been the first person of color at every place I've ever worked at. And, um, 
That's and so I always incredible. think that's part of God's plan that it worked that way. And but it's been something but you said that yes. I've and I and I said yes, and it's been something I've enjoyed. So when did you when did you retire? How long ago? I retired. Uh, it'll be three years ago. Uh, when when the, the school year starts. And what's beautiful is that I know you've done this longer than three years, but you have a text that you send out every day. I just got on the text, so I'm so yeah. excited. And yeah. you send a Bible verse every That's day. Right. And how many people are on that text list at That's, this point? There's, there there are 1,100 people wow. on the text list that I sent out. And I've been sending that out. It has to be probably 15 years now. It's so I've awesome. been sent it out. And it, it's, it's so interesting about that text. Um, I remember one day at school, a kid coming up to me because I had something at, at the meeting time and I wasn't able to send it out at the time I regularly do. And these kids came up to me, Mr. Morrison, you haven't sent your text out today. And I was like, how do you know about my text <laughs> message? Well, you send it to so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so sends it to her kids. Oh, and then wow. they forward it to us. And so, and I have people on that text that are from women's shelters that I've never met. So I'll have a friends call me up and they'll give me a number and they say, add this number to your text list and send it out to them. So there's people so you that's don't been, even know. Yeah. So I don't even know who they are and haven't met them. But uh, it's it's, beautiful. I know it's grown and I know it's impact because a lot of them will tell me that they send the text there are other people. Yeah. And so Nathan so said it to me at, forever. Yeah. Yeah. But now I'm and official. So, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's been so touching. And one of the strangest things was about it. One time I was driving coming from uh, Austin and this girl tell, calls me and she said, who is this? And I said, Robert Moore. She said, I get a text from this number every day. And I said, I, and I said, well, it must be a number change because I didn't recognize her. I knew who the number was stored under. And she said, I said, I'll stop sending. And she said, oh, no, please don't stop sending. And she said, I got, she said, I bought this phone. And she said, a day after I had, two days after I had bought the phone, she said, I was involved in a severe car accident. And she said, when they pulled up there, the EMS, the emergency responders did not think I would live. She said, they talked me to the hospital and she said, my parents and family were all brought in. They didn't think I, they didn't think I would live uh, through the week. And she said she was in a coma for about right, two weeks. And she said, when she woke up, they, uh, one day the phone got a text on the phone as the, this uh, Bible scripture. And she said, it was like God was talking to me. And she's like, and then she said, I started getting these Bible verses every day. And she said, it was every one of them was like, God was talking to me because she said, I wanted to give up. And he was talking about fear not and for the Lord is with you always. And she told me the story and she said, I had gotten away from the church. I had turned my back on God and I, I didn't want to have anything to do with God. And she said, there wasn't a number stored. And she said, this number kept coming in with this text. She said, it just was like, he was talking to me every day on my recovery. And so I told her, I told her who I was and she told me she had gotten that number. That's the reason it wasn't stored in her phone, but it was still in mine. And, and she oh, said, she said, you have helped save my life. She said, Stop. Cause I was giving up and she said, I got these every day. She said, cause we, even when I came out of my surgery, I had no will to live cause I had so many injuries. So that was, uh, that was one of the touching stories about the Bible verse, but nearly every day, somebody will respond to me. I'm going through a rough period and that's exactly what I needed today to get by. And so, I feel like that's kind of, the center of your story is that you always said yes to what God asked you to do, whether yes. or not you were aware <laughs> right. of what he was asking you to do. You that did. Is... You said yes. And even I, that's what is so beautiful about you mm -hmm. and who you are and your, your impact that you've made on your community is that right. it goes beyond what you chose with your profession, which was admirable and the work that you did there, but that you can still make an impact. And I want to ask you about retirement uh, specifically because 
the work you did obviously is something you're so proud of as you should be mm-hmm. and something that um that i i have a benefit of because i married someone who got to be you know around you in his formation right. And is now as a man around you in his formation right. because you guys have a Thursday night group that meets online. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's great. Oh, it's so great. So when you did choose to retire, that's got to be a pretty big decision because you look mm-hmm. very healthy and young and spry. Like, I feel like you right. could have done things forever. So what had to, this is a question I ask all my guests, but I want to ask it here in your life. What had to quiet down in your life for you to hear God telling you to to retire especially when that was something so important to you what had to quiet down for you to hear him at that time i just realized it sometimes you can be in a situation and people will not allow you to flourish and be successful and and that was one of those environments and i remember every day i'm a, I'm a praying person i get an opportunity i'm praying when i'm driving i'm praying I, and I remember driving home, the, the weather was pretty nice one day and then because the temperatures re- really, really hot or really cold. And I had my sunroof down and I was praying to the Lord. And I was like, Lord, is, is this the right decision for me? And I had started praying that pretty early. I prayed before I went up there, but I prayed that as I got there. And I said, is, is this the right place for me? I need an answer. And on this one particular day, I had my sunroof open because the weather was pretty nice. And this flock of birds were flying over. And as they were flying over Mockingbird Lane, I realized that some of them pooped and it came through my sunroof <laughs> and it landed on me. And I remember saying, I remember saying, Lord, I asked you to give me an answer. You didn't have to be so graphic, <laughs> drastic, but, but thank you for my name. Thank you for my answer. <laughs> I'm not lying. That is, that is a tr- true story. And that's, <laughs> sunroof equals and i retired yeah and so <laughs> so that's what you so had at to that time I, I realized I you know it. i had yeah i had gone up there on a multi-year contract and at that time i i just decided that i'll kill myself here because yeah. i know i'm being one of those that if there's you a challenge there i accept the challenge and i'll work hard at it even if it's going to kill me. So I was working longer days and going to all these activities and, and uh, probably short-sighted and seeing the progress it was with some teachers because after I left there, I realized there were a lot of teachers that did appreciate me, but all you ever heard from was the ones who didn't. And then the, it, was, uh, the, it was a Church of Christ community. So it, you saw these clicks in different areas where if you weren't part of this church, then you were an outsider. And then I, when I, when I saw how it affected kids, it's probably when I noticed it the most. Because I, kids, I saw kids going into these programs where it rewarded kids for bad behavior. Kid didn't come to school, wouldn't turn in his work. So we put him in this program so he could accelerate. But he really didn't learn anything. It was just these things for the school had a place to accelerate them. And I actually kind of referred to it almost as an educational welfare system where these kids were rewarded for not doing things that are going to be successful. And when I heard one of the administrators say one day that uh, we need to just get these kids a degree so they can work at McDonald's. And I was sitting there like, since when? Could that be the educational goal for our kids? Not that McDonald's isn't a place to work with, but when you're talking about black, brown, and poor white kids, I had a vision of higher standing than that, than what I noticed a lot of people there. So it was basically just getting them certification to get them out of school. And so things kind of turned south at that time. I, I realized I was going to be there, and then I realized I wasn't a, appreciate it and probably go get the same fair chance. So I, I, I worked my butt off that year and, and I probably would have uh, retired after my first year there, but I had bought a house and I didn't, didn't want to lose so much money. So I stayed a second year there and then I retired a year there, but that was what led to it. And it, and, and I knew at, at that time I was probably, I was burned out from what things I went through and, sure. and I was right. just like, I needed 
what I guess kids nowadays call it a gap year. I didn't call it a gap year. <laughs> but I just needed some a time in a way that, yeah. Yeah. You had a lot of crap literally fall on you. I I really did. God was like, I see your crap uh and I'm telling you, take a break. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think it was God, I think it was God centered because like I said, there was no one else there. So 90% of my conversation that wasn't with the adults on school was talking to God. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I prayed to him and I I was like, it's, it's time to move on. Yeah. And that was a good sign, actually. I mean, that was really actually kind of fit the whole thing. So now that you're retired, where are you still finding your, where you get to make a difference in the world besides your texting? Have you found a a space for you to keep gifting? I found a space for me. uh, And I think uh, some of it's through social media because I've had opportunity to do uh, more things there. And and I'm one of those on social media that doesn't just like and put a heart on it, I'll reach out to someone that I see is going through stuff because I, I know the social media facade. Everybody on social media is having a great life and da 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 da. So I'll message them sometime and say, No, really, how are you doing? How, how did you know something was wrong, Mr. Morrison? Uh, well, I just figured something was wrong just by the little dynamics of something you text or so on. So I find myself helping you know, young adults now and helping adults with their kids through uh, social media. And I'm able to go meet uh, former students and talk to them and help them with their kids and what they're going through. And I'm used as a resource by a lot of administrators around the state and teachers about how to deal with situations and certain kids. And I, they reach out to me when they realize a kid doesn't have clothes and stuff. So I'm picking, connected enough with some people locally. I'll go get clothes and stuff. And so you're still doing all the same. You're, so you're still, still the same. You're Batman. The <laughs> There's a yeah. bat signal for, <laughs> yes, for there Mr. Is. Morrison. So where so, can people find you on the internet? Those who were not blessed to have you as a teacher or an administrator or a colleague. Okay. Is there a place that you're comfortable that the public can come and and follow you? Well, I, I, I really am comfortable everywhere there. It's, it's, uh, I have a Instagram, uh, uh, Twitter, and then I have uh, LinkedIn and so Facebook, and then I have a page on Facebook. But I, I find a lot of people contact me through, through those areas. Well, I'll put all of your information in yes. the show notes. So people can connect with you. Mm -hmm. I want to just say, this has been so fantastic. I'm so excited that we finally got to meet in real life. Not really. This is like in virtual life. But um, as soon as COVID, which by the way, we're we're recording right now and it's still the pandemic. (laughs) Because I don't know when people will listen. But uh, currently we're in a pandemic. So I can't wait for when that's over. We'd love to have you over for dinner Oh, I, I would love to see you. Your, your husband, I've always had such admiration for him. He's, he's such a bright person. And and he ha- he has one of the skills that I've always told people about. Uh, people in communication, I think they think the greatest means of communication is what they say and articulate. And Nathan is very much like I am. I think the bra- great, greatest skill you can have in communication is being able to listen. That's so true. And the people. Because I know with students that are coming in, a lot of those parents say, well, they will never talk to us. We've asked them stuff. But then I'd find out when, if they were in the presence of a kid, I would ask the kid something their parent would talk for. And so kids would tell me, well, the common thing I hear was, you're listening. You don't judge, you listen. And I was like, yeah, I listen because I need to absorb what you're saying and the and the empathy from where you're coming from. And it'd be wrong for me to think that you're just a checklist and I can have a response as soon as you say so. Cause I know it's the hardest thing to do with people when it comes from their heart is to communicate it to someone else, mm-hmm. whether it's a therapist or not. And so I always was wanted to be one of those people that if they ever got the comfort to talk, not to create a wall for them by me interjecting and cutting them off. So. I That's listen. true. Yeah, listening mm-hmm. is is 
beyond what, and that's what I think what we're missing so much right now. There's a oh, yeah. lot of talking going on on our planet, uh -huh. a, a lot in oh, our country yes. and not enough people listening and not enough people listening and not enough people processing, taking the pa the pause. We don't have the mm -hmm. pause anymore. No, there is no pause button anymore. No, it's react mm -hmm. and respond. And if you did it yeah. fast enough, then that means this about you. And it's a lot right now. There's yeah. a lot going on in our country and our world. And I think you're right about, we need to bring back listening and just and pausing mm -hmm. and then forming if if you're supposed to say something yeah you know it needs to be intelligent something. so nathan has taught me that since we were 15 <laughs> and mm -hmm. thank god we're still married so he can continue to teach me <laughs> because yeah. well, that is i know he way. loves his family and he he brags on he brags on you so much so. <laughs> but we hear we hear sweet. a lot about you on a on the <laughs> on He's our so Zoom bad. meeting so he feels like the luckiest man in the world and he, he tells me stories from his upbringing and about his family and so on and some of their biases and so on so he is he, a he, good good egg i got a good one yes, yes you did well and thank you for being part of his story and now thank you for being part of mine well, so I, I appreciate you i i love it and maybe one day we could talk again I, I would love to in Thank any you. time. Up. All right, sir. You have a good day. Thank you. Lots of love. Mwah. Well, thank you so much for listening to Talk to Me with Liv Harrison, the stories behind their success. I am so excited that this podcast has launched and I need your help. I need you to take a moment to subscribe. I need you to please share it on your social media platforms and with your friends and your colleagues and your kids. All right, maybe not your kids. And I need you to leave me a review and a rating, especially on Apple. I really need your help. So if you enjoyed it, come back. Do that by subscribing, by sharing, by passing the word around. And until then, I'll be listening for you. Okay, fine. You'll be waiting to hear from me. <laughs> Bye, you guys. See you next time.